great to be at Wine Watch. And so uh, I want to thank uh, Andrew for hosting us. And we're excited about today's bill signing and announcement. Uh, some of you may have figured out what it's about. And uh, you know, things like that are now going to be uh, commonplace in the state of Florida. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Before I do, uh, I want to recognize uh, other folks that we have here in attendance. We have our uh, Secretary for the Florida Department of Business and Professional uh, Regulation, Melanie Griffin is with us, Representative, <laughs> Representative Chip Lamarca. Uh, <laughs> is this your district or your, yeah. you include right here too? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, of course, I mentioned uh, uh, Andrew, who's the owner here of Wine Watch. Yeah. And then we also <laughs> We also have uh, uh, Christian, I'm sorry, the, the light isn't good, uh, Christian Sloopy, uh, CEO of uh, Lake Ridge Winery and Vineyards. Did I say that one right? Sloop. Sloop, okay, Sloopy. thank you, thank you for coming. And so they're gonna say a few words. Uh, before we get into the wine, i uh, point out, uh, just to make a few comments on some other issues. Two years ago, um, I, uh, I vetoed the congressional uh, redistricting map that the legislature passed. We ended up getting a different map. Um, there was a lot of carping back then. A lot of media were saying somehow that that map was not going to pass uh, legal muster. Uh, there was a lot of gnashing of teeth um, about that. Uh, and so now, last night, there was a three-judge panel, federal, <laughs> federal court, three to zero, upheld the map as being constitutional. And that's what we said they had. And then in our state courts, the first district court of appeals upheld the map, and there'll be another review from the Florida Supreme Court. So I don't think you're going to see anything different than what's already been happening. And so you, know, you get a lot of gnashing of teeth. You get a lot of people that try to offer analysis, and then once this stuff actually comes into uh, you know rubber meets the road, turns out they were full of hot air. But you don't see them go back and say, oh yeah, you know, we were wrong about that. No, they just act like it never happened. Uh, the reality is uh, we were right in 2022 to veto the map. We were right to sign the revised map. Uh, and we were right when we said that they would be upheld in the courts as being constitutional. And so that's just where we are two years later. Uh, another uh, example of, of kind of the, the gnashing of teeth you know, yesterday it was publicized that uh, Disney has agreed to drop uh, all its claims against the state of Florida. And this was something that, uh, going back two years ago, parents' rights in education, people were complaining, we've won on the parents' rights in education in the state of Florida. That is the law of the land, and, and that's something that parents uh, appreciate. We also said that, you know, uh, in the state of Florida, we're the best state to do business in, but it's wrong to give one company all these special privileges that nobody else gets. And so we dissolve this anachronistic Reedy Creek district that was basically controlled by one company uh, and impose the state control board over that area. So now that's being governed for the best interest of the state of Florida, not merely for the best interest of one particular company. People gnashed teeth at that. They said that that somehow was going to be a problem. And not only has it not been a problem, uh, that board has saved taxpayers millions and millions of dollars uh, because they're governing with transparency and effectiveness. Now, before that board took over in 2023, Disney executed these 11th hour agreements with the old district, which they controlled. So it's basically like doing a contract with yourself. Uh, purporting to tie up the land, purporting to impose covenants, all this stuff. And that was portrayed in the media as, oh, Disney has outmaneuvered uh, the state of Florida, N not even looking at that these things were not going to pass muster. Um, and that was kind of what they would try to do. Well, yesterday's agreement uh, acknowledges that those covenants and those 11th hour agreements done uh, between the old district and the company are null and void. And so we were right about that. Uh, and we were also right that you're not going to have a First Amendment challenge uh, to changing the structure of a local government. So right on parents' rights, right on changing the local government, and right that all the, the 
uh, covenants and development agreements done at the 11th hour are in fact null and void. You saw a lot of gnashing of teeth last year talking about, oh, these development agreements, how smart, all this other stuff. Uh, now you don't hear as much uh, about how, but the reality is our position in every single thing we've done uh, over the last two years with respect to not just the parents' rights, but also the local government there in Central Florida, uh, every single action that we've taken uh, stands, um, has been upheld, and will be the law of the land in the state of Florida going forward. So that's just the fact. Uh, that was not what a lot of people have been saying over the last two years, uh, yet here we are. Uh, final thing I'll say is we have uh, now rescued uh, over 100 uh, Floridians from Haiti. Uh, you have a very difficult situation there, and, and it's our view that if uh, the federal government's not stepping up to do the job that you would expect to rescue American citizens, uh, then by golly, we're going to go in there and, and help our people. We did it in Israel after the October 7th attack by Hamas, and we're now doing it in Haiti as that uh, country uh, never uh, necessarily uh, uh, well run. There was always been a lot of problems, but it's gotten even even worse in the last few weeks. So uh, we're going to keep doing that as long as we think we have people in harm's way. And I'm happy to do that. I thank the Florida Department of Emergency Management for stepping up and getting it done. And it's not just chartering a plane and like you know an orderly uh, people get on. I mean, there are people in situations that require assistance on the ground to be able to get where they need to go, and our guys have been able to do that. So I thank them very much for that, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have more good news uh, in the not-so-distant future. So we're here today uh, to talk about wine and to talk about uh, something that uh, I know is near and dear to the hearts of many people in our state, and to be frank, it's something that was near and dear to the hearts of a lot of people that founded this country. Historians say that Wine was used to toast the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It's also been reported that George Washington uh, would drink wine uh, almost every evening. And as somebody who has often cited Washington's example uh, as uh, something that people in political office should follow, uh, I knew that we had to uh, work with the legislature to ensure that Florida was living up uh, to those great traditions. And so what they were able to do in the legislature is look at laws in the state of Florida that were just anachronistic, that were not good for businesses like this, and not good for Florida consumers. And so that's why I'm signing the bill here today. Uh, prior to signing this bill, uh, a, a bottle like this was not able to be sold uh, in, a, in a store like this in the state of Florida. Uh, and people need these for different, I, I asked, I was like, would people buy those? Because I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, if you have a wedding, if you have a special celebration, there's, there's definitely things to do. So now you can go all the way up. Is this the Nebuchadnezzar, this That's one right, right here? There. This is the Nebuchadnezzar. So you can go all the way up to, to 15 uh, uh, liters now in the state of Florida, and that's almost uh, four gallons. So it was it was odd because I think you could have ordered that online, right, to be delivered. Uh, so there were ways that like, that you could do. So there was really no public policy reason why we should have this regulation. And this is a regulation that was something that had been in place for many, many decades. And I know there have been a lot of folks in the legislature working on it. Chip LaMarca was one that's been working on this. You think, like, this seems like common sense, right? Uh, it's not really that easy to do this. I mean, there was a lot of, there were businesses that had developed around the old regime. And so when you try to uh, make reforms, it just gets complicated in the legislative body. So uh, as much as we look here and say, yeah, of course, it was actually not an easy lift. It didn't just happen. He worked very hard over a number of years to be able to get this Done. But this is an example of us cutting unnecessary red tape and eliminating uh, out-of-state regulations. Uh, we want our businesses to thrive. We want our consumers to be happy. Uh, and if that means they want to buy and sell um, a big old bottle of wine like this, then by golly, they're going to be able to do that in the state of Florida. So I, I thank everybody who's been involved in that. And I think nobody... Uh, uh, 
uh, there's nobody, no one better to come up and talk about uh, what this will mean for, for this community and throughout the state than the man behind this in the legislature, Chip Lamarca. Come on. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so I've been in the legislature six years and served in local government before that. And I think I will probably be known for freeing college athletes and freeing the grapes. But <laughs> we did some great work with My Safe Florida Home with almost a half a billion dollars over the last few years in hardening homes and things like that. Uh, before I start, and I'll be brief, I wanted to mention a few of the elected officials that are here that serve in our community. Uh, our newest elected official, Abby Stafford from My City Lighthouse Point. <laughs> Commissioner John Hurt from the city of Fort Lauderdale. I think Commissioner John Brody was here from Coconut Creek. Back here. Come here. Back there. And uh, also, we all know Shane Strum, who's running, doing a great job running our hospital system, and Bob Swindell of the Alliance. So this, as the governor said, this seemed like a really easy thing, right? We're just going to repeal the small part of, of licensing, and, and DBPR will take care of it. You can buy what you want to buy. And as the governor said, factions of, we'll say factions of lobbyists, factions of other consumer uh, producers that didn't want you to buy something like this. Um, but for many years, and I, and I might have mentioned his first name last year when I closed on the bill and it still didn't pass, but uh, this was the fifth year I ran the bill again, and, this year, and, and now you have to actually use a bill slot. So I was, I was committed to it, but Jason Unger and, and this year uh, Jeff Aaron, both from, uh, from Tallahassee, were very, very helpful on this, and I just want to thank you guys. Uh, but this is, as you can see, what, what, what we've orchestrated here when they said get some folks here, friends and family, but more importantly, this is an Italian-American-owned business, Italian-American governor, and Italian-American uh, state representative. So uh, wine is a big part of our culture, uh, whether it's the American side or the Italian side. Uh, I just want to thank the governor for, for being here, making this a special day for, for Andrew. Uh, Andrew Lampasone and I went to high school together. His late brother and I played in a rock band together, believe it or not. And... Uh, uh, we just have a lot of history, and people call this home on seven days a week, but also on Saturday <laughs> afternoons if you have a bottle of wine you want to do brown back Saturday. Uh, Andrew's just really been a part of the community, and really the free market allowing to, to, to uh, sell what should be, which is already legal, just in a different size, was, uh, was where we were at this. So I just want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, Governor, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I think we're going to have the Secretary speak as well. Yeah, come on up. First, I want to thank the governor and you, Representative Lamarca, and your fellow legislators who worked on this bill. Under the governor's leadership, Florida continues to cut red tape and make it easier to do business in our state, which is also important to the department. So, I want to give you one more round of applause, Governor, for your commitment. <laughs> As the governor mentioned, the signage of HB 583 into law will allow Florida businesses to sell and purchase wine in glass containers up to 15 years, as we're seeing here. And while wine lovers across the state rejoice that fact, I want to take a moment to emphasize just how impactful that is for Florida businesses. I have the pleasure of, um, reg um, of working with 1.7 million licensees, and not only does this bill create a potential cost savings for 51,000 DBPR licensees, it also allows Florida to be competitive with other states who are already selling wine in these larger quantities. When Florida's wine and spirits industry, it has a $10.2 billion impact. And when you account for suppliers, producers, wholesalers, and retailers, that impact grows to more than $17 billion. This industry is a major economic driver in our state, and with a governor who continues to make decisions that are good for business, I am confident we will continue to see our business climate and economy thrive. DBPR is committed to supporting the governor's efforts to continue making it easier to do business in Florida, and we look forward to continued growth of Florida's licensee base, including all of our spirit licensees, as more people and businesses move to Florida, and as a result of our governor's business-friendly policies. Thank you for allowing us to be here, and looking forward to the bill signing. All right. Well, I'm, I just want to say I can't believe this day has finally come, you know. Chip, uh, who I went to high school with, you know, we've been talking about this for years. And, uh, you know, the fact that Florida is the number two market in the country for domestic products. Of course, California is number one. They control 90% or more of all the wine that's grown in the, in the country. We're the number two market for imported wine products. Well, I mean, maybe number one after they shut down New York. That was number one for years. And Florida may have eclipsed them for good. But uh, at the end of the day, when you look at the 500 distributors, wholesalers, and the thousands of retailers like us, 
This is a huge ep economic impact. A lot of people may not think we're going to sell a lot of these big, big bottles, but if the 500 wholesalers just sell a dozen a year and the thousands of retailers just sell one or two a year, that amounts to a huge economic impact. And, hey, those two states I just mentioned have been allowed to sell big bottles for many years. So thanks for yes, bringing us up to where we needed to be to compete with the big boys, California and New York, in terms of wine sales. So uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming here to sign the bill. This is the coolest thing that's happened at Wine Watch ever. <laughs>
proverbial cheese puffs. Uh, how do you how do you see your administration working with Disney now? And are you going to be taking your kids to Disney or something? So the uh, in terms of it's interesting. We and spring break. Uh, we took our kids to Universal Islands of Adventure in the studios, and and it was it was crowded. But like when you went into those Harry Potter areas, it was packed, unbelievable. I mean, they are just printing money with Harry Potter. Um, you know, J.K. Rowling is just a genius for what she. I mean, it's like the the, the intensity and all that. So that's a that's been a cash cow for Universal, and then they have Epic Universe coming. Uh, Epic Universe is going to be as big as Islands of Adventure and Universal Studios combined. Bigger than that. I think I actually just saw a video, I didn't have a chance to watch it, where they previewed one part of Epic Universe. So they've really upped the game. So we are in a situation now where that district that includes Disney, that's not run by Disney, it's run by the, the state of Florida and through appointees for people that you've elected and then have turned around and exercised their appointment authority. And it's going to be governed not just be based on what one corporation wants, but what's on the best interest of the community and the state. And I do think that we would like to see uh, more, uh, more development in that area. I think that, I said yesterday, if, if Universal's doing this epic universe, Disney's probably gonna have to answer that with something. So I think the board we have in place would be willing to negotiate that. Now obviously, the district controls most of that land that Disney doesn't own, so there would need to be an agreement, but I think the state would make out very, very well if something like that happened, and so that's, uh, that's what we're gonna be doing. But, um, you know, there's, there's financial, I mean, look, I, I'm like, you only live once, right? But like my kids, you know, they'll, we were in there, Harry Potter, you get a little tin of chocolate, and it's $30 for a tin of chocolate. <laughs> Literally, the, the, the cashier's like, do you realize this is $30? Because I guess a lot of people get upset. I was like, you know, I didn't realize that, but I probably didn't assume anything else, so that's fine. And just nonstop with some of the stuff. Uh, so I think that there's some opportunities there for them to be able to do that, and, um, and I think they do it in a way that's going to be in the best interest of the state. But that district will be managed in a way that's gonna pursue the state of Florida's best interest. And if we work together and have mutual interests, that's great, but we're not gonna subordinate the interests of the state uh, just to service one company. Those days are over. Governor, the Florida Supreme Court is supposed to be deciding the fate of abortion access in a matter of like minutes, potentially giving voters the right to decide. Do you believe that voters should be able to vote on this measure of abortion access? So when you, anytime you file those amendments, uh, you know, there's certain uh, rules that you have to follow, and I know there's been a lot of litigation over that. It's not been something I've been a party to, but our Attorney General, I think, has handled that very ably, uh, and I think that she's made arguments that have been, been very compelling. So, so we'll have to see uh, what ends up happening, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. I yes, sir. Uh, you've had a lot of victories lately that you pointed out, that the Babylon Bee even uh, ran a satire article that went viral, saying that you had been kicked out of the Republican Party for having too many victories. So my question, my question is, is um, has every the Republican Party reached out to you? Because uh, they seem to have some problems having these legal victories. And uh, what uh, advice would you give to them? Well, well, look, I mean, you know, it's interesting. This congr You look at what's happening in DC. Uh, Republicans have gotten nothing done up there. Um, but if it wasn't for Florida, we added four Republicans in 22 to our congressional delegation. Democrats would have the House right now uh, if it wasn't for Florida. That's just a fact. Uh, that would be the case. So we've done, I think, everything that we could do in Florida to put points on the board. We Obviously, you see the party expanded. Heck, we have a, Republicans getting elected in various parts of Broward which people didn't think were possible. Uh, you look at Miami-Dade, what happened in 22 there. So this state has moved, I think, in the direction that, that, that Republicans have wanted to see all states move, and we're really the model about how you get that done. That is not necessarily something that I think has been replicated in other states. I think other states have actually tried to go about it a different way, and they're, they're free to do that. But, but, but our model obviously works, and, and what it works is, is it's not based on Oh yes, we're doing you know this this uh, uh, lever of the party, or we're trying to do this uh, voter registration drive. Like I'm not saying that doesn't matter, but our movement here in Florida has been driven by results, and it's been driven by doing things that people want to see done. I mean, just yesterday I signed a bill 
to say, you know, if someone takes over your house, like if you're gone for summer vacation, they take over your house, you show up, you get the sheriff to kick them out. They don't get to assert rights against you. I mean, what world are we living in where you're incentivizing that behavior? So this is just common sense. Uh, a lot of stuff that we've done over the years has just been common sense. So I, I just think it's rooted in, in success and delivering results. And when you tell people you're going to do something, then do it. And sometimes I'll get asked questions, oh, you know, what about this, what about that? And if I don't think I can get it done, I, I don't make a promise uh, on things. If I, if I know I can get it done, then I'll say, here's what I'm going to do. And then I go and say, okay, I made that promise, I got to do. I look in Washington, all these guys ran saying, the gov we have so much debt, the government's spending too much money. And then what have they done? They just turned around, they did a massive spending increase uh, that's going to add more to the debt. It's not going to help with inflation. It's funding all of Biden's open border policies. So I think that's bad in of itself. But what happens is when you govern in a way that's contrary to how you campaigned and what you told the voters you're due, that creates dissatisfaction. And I think that there's a lot of that with Republican voters across the country right now. I think Florida is one of the exceptions. And there's been other states you know, that, have done, that have done good things. But I think we've been the leader um, on all this stuff. So, so just produce results. That's really the way that, that you do. And we were talking about some of the business and all this other stuff. Um, our, I mean, California has the highest unemployment rate in the country. They should have the lowest. They have such a, I mean, it's a naturally beautiful state, wine industry, all these other things. But we have the lowest unemployment rate amongst large states. Um, I mean, Miami, Dade, it's like, it's like as low as it's probably ever been. I mean, it's, it, but that is as a result of, of having good policies. And oh, by the way, in the most recent budget, which I haven't signed yet, but we will over the next couple months, uh, we have another $500 million dedicated to accelerated debt repayment for the state's debt. So as Washington's adding more to the debt, not only are we reducing our debt in Florida, we're accelerating the repayment to where we're able to purchase some of these bonds on the open market at, at, at reduced prices, essentially. Uh, and so we have the lowest per capita debt in the entire United States of America amongst all 50 states. Uh, that is success. That's people see that and they know, yeah, you guys don't have an income tax, which is great, but there would never be a need to have an income tax here because we're not like Illinois where you're a fiscal basket case and you have all these unfunded liabilities and you're running up a lot of debt. Governor, about a mile from here, there is a growing homeless camp along I-95 in the rail station. You have homeless living in tents cars, RVs, and even a sailboat, and it's right next to a very modest working class neighborhood, I mean literally two lanes across from the backyards of these homes. Well, how can you protect, how can we protect our own neighborhoods while we wait for the enforcement and all the legal wrangling over the recent legislation? Well, help is on the way. Uh, our legislation is speaking to exactly the concern uh, that I think your question evinces is that this has an impact on our communities. Uh, what they have done in San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, first of all, that's not even good for the homeless. That is indulging in the behavior that's causing the epidemic. Uh, so it's not even good for them. But it's really bad if you can't walk your dog down the street, you can't have kids going out and playing in a neighborhood because of drug use and homeless that are there. So the legislation that we sign, it says very simply, no public sleeping, no camps on sidewalks, parks, any of these streets. Uh, you have a right as a Floridian to live your life without having that impinge on you. And it's the local government's responsibility to ensure that those homeless can be removed to a shelter and if they run out of shelter space in an area that is not uh, going to impact the general public because it hurts property values when this stuff happens. It obviously increases crime and criminal activity. Uh, so we are trying to structure this in a way that is going to compel local governments to put their citizens first and to put the law-abiding, productive citizens first and the families first. And, and if we do that, we're going to do much better. This is a cutting-edge piece of legislation that we did. No one else in the country has done it. Uh, and, I, and I do understand there are pockets in Florida where, where we see this. It is not at the scale of a New York or California. In fact, our homeless population has declined 
uh, by, I think, 11% over the last five years. Most of these other places have skyrocketed. But I think it's smart that we're looking at it to make sure that we don't end up going down that road. Same thing with the squatters. The squatters has not been a huge issue in Florida. There have been issues. And we had some people talk about it at the press conference yesterday. But I think mostly it's how does that get weaponized in some of like a New York or a California against homeowners. And it is being weaponized. So we put legal protections to basically say that's not going to happen in the state of Florida. You show up, and especially in South Florida, where we have a lot of seasonal residents, someone goes uh, and they go back up to, to, to New York for the summer, or they go back up to Pennsylvania or something, and then they come back and somebody's in their condo or their home, um, you call the sheriff and remove them immediately. That should be the remedy. Shouldn't have to spend seven months in a legal proceeding to try to figure out uh, whether you can get your own property back. Governor, do you think Broward No, um, not from what I've read, no. I mean, now, I haven't spoken to Manny Diaz about that uh, per se, but uh, I think what they were doing is not following uh, the, the spirit of the law. And these charter programs, look, in Broward, you've got a number of schools that have done very, very well. In fact, our charter population in, in Florida is now close to 400,000 students. If you look demographically, they would skew low income. They would also skew more racially and ethnically diverse. Um, if you took that almost 400,000 cohort and they were their own state, which is actually as big a student population as a lot of states have total K-12, it would be one of the top five or six performing states in the country. And so, so our charter programs have worked in the state of Florida. When they don't do a good job, parents don't send them there, and then the, then the, the schools have trouble. But we've done things like, we've done this turnaround school program. You had a school in the Panhandle that was just in total disrepair. Charter operator came and took over, and now it's, it's, it's turn, turning around. So I think it's been a good, good thing to have in this state, and ultimately having choice, both private scholarships. We're getting close to 400,000 kids on private scholarships, charter, and then within school districts, you've got a lot of choice. I mean, Miami-Dade has a lot of, uh, of, of, of choice within the school district. I don't know that Broward has as much as Dade does, uh, but there are meaningful choices where I think you probably have close to a million five students in some type of choice program, maybe a magnet, uh, maybe an IB, maybe a charter, maybe a private uh, scholarship school. And, and that is really, really good for parents. And uh, I do not envy any politician at this point in Florida who's going to try to do this teacher union's bidding and say they want to take away those choices for parents. Uh, I think that's a loser politically, and I think it should be a loser. Thank right. you. Appreciate you guys.